For the library of the Duke's archives of all material pertinent to the Convergence, hail Anne Orlando, in the first flame we trust. This is transcript officer number 16, record 736F75, stroke 6C, commencing log. Now. Modern era. The eternal. At the heart of all beauty lies something inhuman. Stray old dear, how long have I been treading these lands? I often wonder how many moons have passed for you on each passing of mine. How long since I last penned you any words? How long since my last respite? Life in the lands between feels less oppressive than in that old world of ours. The importance of my task somehow not looming so dreadfully out the corner of my eye. And I can't for the life of me decide whether the calmness of these days would rub you the right or the wrong way. Here there will be days of lucid dreaming rather than nightmares without end. But you and I, my friend, were not built in such a way. I suspect you two would be as restless as I am. And that thought alone, I confess, puts a smile on my face. And yes, restless I am. The business of God slaying too is a hunter's work. And the idyllic veil of this world can fool me no longer. For what is a dream of despair, but just a nightmare by another name? The First Cardinal Sin The quest of the tarnished is one that invariably leads to sin. The burning of the air tree, the first cardinal sin, is indispensable to our success. An act of sacrilege that can only be achieved with the assistance of Melina, formerly known as the Glomide Queen. Though, when we first meet her, that maiden is not yet aware of the sacrifice that will be required of her. She knows she's been given a purpose by Merica, but the nature of that duty eludes her completely. Until, that is, our accord has been fulfilled at the foot of the air tree. The only way to stand before the Elden Ring and become the Elden Lord is to pass the thorns, my purpose serves to aid in that very act, so I'd like you to undertake a new journey with me to the Flame of Ruin, far above the clouds, upon the snowy mountain tops of the giants. Then I can set the Erd Tree aflame and guide you down the path to becoming Elden Lord. From what I could glean upon hearing this revelation, it seemed to me that her purpose wasn't just to aid a tarnished to take the throne of the Elden Lord, but also to specifically do it by burning the Aird Tree. If so, that would imply that the first cardinal sin was a part of Merica's plan all along, in accordance with the vision Grace had bestowed to her. And though it could be argued that burning the Aird Tree was Melina's decision so that she could realize Merica's plan, which didn't originally involve the Flame of Ruin, there are a few pieces of evidence that contradict this supposition. First, it must be said that Melina is the one to bestow the rolled medallion upon the tarnished of her own accord, and I can't stress enough the degree to which this indicates her purpose to always have included access to the mountaintops of the giants. And though a little more circumstantial in nature, it could also be argued that Melina's blade of calling, having been found on the way to said mountains, in a hidden chamber formerly overseen by a magisterial official whose duties included gruesome rituals, serve as evidence to that conclusion as well. Second, there's the fact a vision of it could be glimpsed from within Grace itself, as demonstrated by the records of Fire's deadly sin, incantation originating from a deeply ominous prophecy. The prophet despaired, looking up at the air tree, for soon the kindling would burst into flame, bringing ruin. Remember, old friend, that Grace isn't a creationist and omniscient god. Its vision is not really a glimpse into the future, but rather a glimpse into the future that it seeks to unfold. Carefully planned designs come to fruition, and we call it fate. Everything else is just another failure. And the final and most conclusive piece of evidence is that in order to burn the air tree, Melina must use the Forge of the Giants to transport the Tarnish to Faramazula, where the prized rune of death is kept. And I see how this could be interpreted as a decision made by Melina and Melina alone, but the truth of the matter is that this event, using the Forge to reach Malaketh, had been set up to take place regardless of her participation. You see, the same effect can be achieved with or without her help, 
should the tarnished have surrendered themselves to the flame of frenzy. This demonstrates that it is in fact the forge itself which triggers the effect, not Melina. Considering all parts involved, the flame of ruin, destined death, and the frenzied flame were members of the same cluster of outer gods, America must have set up the forge to only work with one touched by the powers of that cluster which, in theory, should have ensured only one that's being guided by Melina, now a servant of America, would go any further and become Elden Lord. This reminds me of Enya, finger reader of the hold, who once told me, a sacrifice was needed of one who envisions flame. In order to complement this last point, it is also worth mentioning that after the deed is done and the rune of death has been released, the tarnished is transported back to Lane Dell, indicating that just like their passage to Faroom was planned, their goal regarding the rune and their return to the Aird Tree were both expected as well. And in retrospect, this revelation shines a new light on the lonely fire giant of the mountaintops. From its remembrance hewn into the air tree, we hear tale that Merica spared his life as a form of punishment. But since the flame of ruin was necessary for her plans to unfold, it can be stipulated his penance served an ulterior purpose as well. To keep those cinders from going out with time, thus ensuring her designs would come to pass. Never attribute to fate that which can be explained as careful preparation. O trifling giant, Mayst thou tend thy flame for eternity. The Shattering Just as a tarnished cannot complete their ordeal without the prearranged burning of the aired tree, our quest would not have needed the first cardinal sin without the shattering of the Elden Ring. And so I believe the breaking of the rings to have been a matter of as much careful design as that other pernicious act had been. The burning leaves and the smiting hammer, they were always meant to be. The first clue to this end is that according to her own words, Merica had always intended Godfrey and the Tarnish to return to the lands between. With thine eyes dimmed, ye will be driven from the lands between. Ye will wage war in a land afar, where ye will live and die. Then. After thy death, I will give back what I once claimed, return to the lands between, wage war, and brandish the Elden Ring. It's worth noting the second part of that speech was given in the Church of Pilgrimage, implying that's how the Long March was seen, a pilgrimage unto itself. She knew grace would be lost and restored, and that its guidance would lead them back to the Elden Ring. And perhaps most telling of all, she already expected them to wage war for it. Despite the hints that the hold is in another world, it actually seems to be inside the air tree, given that it's set ablaze once we've burnt it. If so, then it couldn't have been built without her blessing, which indicates Merica's foresight extended to the returning tarnished having a need for it as well. The prearranged nature of this conclusion can be further corroborated by the Chapel of Anticipation, destination of all tarnished crossing the fog. Our arrival at that chapel wasn't a random occurrence as implied by the presence of the deceased finger maiden. The fact its door opens only to those carrying a finger. And even that Vare stands outside the stranded graveyard waiting for the likes of us. Then, in light of all this, the presence of a statue of Merica at the chapel grounds, the Cave of Knowledge specifically meant to instruct incoming Tarnished, and the fact that Melina, whose purpose was given by Merica, finds us there, all point to Merica's foreknowledge of not only our return, but also the how and the where it would happen. And come to think of it, she may even have left Godfrey away to reach the capital unimpeded upon his arrival, through Weeping Peninsula's Tower of Return. I have found a makeshift weapon known as the Rusted Anchor in the nearby Morn Tunnel, and from its records I have learned that, while the Tarnish left the lands between with their lord, one boat alone was said to have been left behind. In the vicinity of that tower, there's also a beach full of shipwrecks and wandering hordes of decaying bodies heading back out to sea. Considering Merica's last words to Godfrey were delivered from this same area of the continent, the implication is that this beach is the point from which he departed, and if he were to come back through the same route, he'd find the Tower of Return waiting to take him to the capital's round table hold. 
and return he did. To my own surprise, I could even see Grace's rays of light guiding Godfrey to me when I faced him amidst those lordless thrones. Twas a vision I shan't soon forget, our first lord of the tarnished and the unmistakable sign that commanded him to end me. Is this how all the so-called gods I've slain felt upon watching me so doggedly hound them, upon each death returning to their arena time and time again? Or were they blinded by hubris? Could it be that gods can't really contemplate defeat until they find, at the end of a sword, their very own most bitter of ends? The second clue telling me Merica had always known she'd eventually shatter the Elden Ring came to me after sifting through the facts surrounding Radigan, her king consort. Upon a superficial reading of the facts, one could walk away with the impression that when Merica transforms into Radigan and vice versa, they are two distinct entities. But the fact is that the statement, Radigan is Merica, is an absolute truth. In this regard, something that should not and cannot be ignored is the Great Rune of the Unborn. Given the link between Radigan and Renala, retainer of this Great Rune, it is unreasonable not to assume the transformation between Radigan and Merica isn't connected to the power of rebirth granted by that rune. This implies that when Merica transforms into Radigan, she's simply changing the appearance and the attributes of her body, rather than surrendering herself completely to another individual entirely. The fact Radigan and Merica were the same being is also implied by the remembrance we are granted after having defeated Melania, which tells us that Mikola and Melania were both the children of a single god. This can be further elucidated by establishing how far back she's been Radigan and juxtaposing that with the actions she'd have taken during that time. First, there's the statue of Radigan that reveals his secret, Radigan is Merica. In order for the sculptor of this monument to have glimpsed such truth, Radigan would have to have revealed it to them, which then means that when Radigan locked himself inside the Erd tree with Merica, he was already Merica herself. Then there's the fact that Merica was already Radigan when she shattered the Elden Ring, which can be seen in the visions of this event that Grace has granted us. And finally, the last time she spoke to Godfrey was in the Church of Pilgrimage, but strangely, the statue found there isn't of Merica. It's of Radigan, implying she could already be living these two identities when Godfrey left. So shattering the Elden Ring is supposed to have been Merica's downfall, the crime for which Radigan imprisoned her inside the Erd Tree and attempted to repair the Elden Ring. But Merica was already Radigan in both instances, meaning her so-called crime and punishment were all part of her plan. This interpretation of Radigan complements the fact that Merica had that poor soul Hugh craft a weapon to slay a god, i.e. Merica herself. There is no other reason for her to have done so, unless she already knew the punishment that would befall her. It also complements the previous point we made that the first cardinal sin was pre-planned as well, since the only purpose of burning the air tree is to break through Radigan's seal. She assumed the guise of Lord Radigan. Through her lying teeth, she told her children she'd imprisoned their mother and try to repair the Elden Ring. Then Grace, or rather its vassal, the Elden Beast, who as I've experienced myself, can perform an attack that has an effect identical to Merica's crucifixion-like predicament, shackled her body in preparation for the next step of their plans. The game, my friend, was rigged from the very start. And from transcript officer number 16, for the record, there are two side notes on the margins of the page that read as follows. The reference to a single god in Melania's remembrance is even more clear when read in the language of the land of reeds, which leaves very little room for doubt regarding this interpretation of the text. And although Merica's original red hair isn't necessary for her transformation into Radigan, it does serve as a hint to the conclusions reached in this missive, and also to the possible birthplace of Radigan himself, who, having been a mountaintop compatriot, would have followed her from the very start. Yet another hint is that Radigan had studied sorceries during his time in Raya Lucaria, but only used incantations when I fought him in the Aird Tree. And also... The records regarding the memory of Grace imply Godfrey and his people may not have been native to the lands between, but were in fact guided by Grace to aid with Merica's war. The memory of First Grace, which once guided bygone tarnished to the lands between. It is merely a cycle, 
Stand before the Elden Ring. Become the Elden Lord. Kintsugi. Having glimpsed America's designs, I simply stood there, confounded by the ramifications. I couldn't for a while make heads or tails of it. Why shadow the Elden Ring? Why work so hard to attain it, all while planning to destroy it? I felt lost, old friend, and I could have used your help. But though the path is long, all steps invariably follow another step already taken. Causality is sure to point us the way, as always. All one needs is enough information and time. And luckily, as an immortal scholar, I had both to spare. The solution to this conundrum, I believe, can be found through the study of the Knight of the Black Knives. As we get started, keep in mind that the objective of this plot wasn't simply to kill Godwin and the other demigods. If it were, and they wouldn't have gone through the trouble of stealing a fragment of Malakath's Rune of Death. The records pertaining to Death Root are misleading when they mention that the stolen rune enabled the first death of a demigod. The original description of those records, first written in the Land of Reeds, makes no such statement. They don't imply cause and effect. They simply describe a succession of events by saying that after the aforementioned first death of a demigod, the stolen fragment, or more likely its effects, spread through the root system and sprouted as death root. So the idea that the demigods were immortal and that the plotters needed the rune of death in order to kill them is unfounded. Merica was the only one true goddess the only one to carry the title of immortal. Her offspring did not share the boon of immortality that she'd been given. Now with that out of the way, our first order of business should be to establish a reasonable connection between Merica and the dire plot. To do that, I'd like to cite three arguments. Those being that the Black Knife assassins were rumored to be Newman who had close ties with Merica herself. That she said to have betrayed Malekith, a claim that is explained by her helping the plotters steal a fragment of the Rune of Death and that her involvement would provide Rani with the knowledge necessary to make use of such fragment in the first place, alongside with the Lunar Princess's own involvement with the Snow Witch, of course. With the added side note that Necromancer Garrus is currently located in the Sage's Cave alongside a Black Knife assassin, and that the fact we can find Garrus's rancor call near Stormvale's Prince of Death connects the plot of the Black Knives and Merica's supposed participation in it to Merica's coup against the Glomide Queen. And I shall go even further by stating Merica probably directed the Knight of the Black Knives herself. To those who are privy to the Queen's aforespoken words, it would do well to remember these ones in particular. Hear me, demigods, my children beloved. Make of thyself that which ye desire, be it a lord, be it a god. But should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. Now let us add to these words those of that unnamed spirit in the Weeping Peninsula saying, The mausoleum prowls, cradling the soulless demigod. O Merica, Queen Eternal, he is your unwanted child. Well, the conclusion seems as clear as moonlight to me. She warned her children they'd become sacrifices, and sacrifices they became. Familial bonds are often overrated, but their truth can be revealed by shining the light of history upon them. Loyalty seldom survives exposure to the possibilities of either glory or death. It's also worth noting that by posing as both mother and father of the demigods, Merica was well positioned to manipulate all of them, regardless of what their proclivities may have been. Rani, for instance, would have been much more amenable to listening to Radigan than Merica. Or so she thought, since in the end, Rani had plans of her own. And speaking of the Lunar Princess, her act of sabotage was the pivotal point from which we can finally determine the purpose of the Knight of Black Knives. Godwin wasn't supposed to have become the Prince of Death. He wasn't supposed to have died in soul only. He was supposed to have died a true death, as the first of the demigods to die, as a martyr to destined death. The reason he didn't is because of Rani's intervention. So if Rani's actions disrupted their plans, what would have happened if she hadn't? Well, since the curse mark should have taken the shape of a circle, then the implication is that Godwin's death was supposed to yield a full curse mark similar to the mending rune of the Death Prince just stated by Fia. 
And the purpose of this rune is, of course, to mend the Elden Ring. As you may recall from a previous letter, we've discussed the fact that the act of mending the Elden Ring is completed by adding new runes to it, new powers to the greater will. They had already defeated Melina and sealed away her rune, but they were yet to bestow its power upon the outer god controlling Grace, who's since taken over the greater will. And that right there was their goal all along. It's just as the old crone told me, Godwin was supposed to have been a martyr to destined death after all. From this conclusion, we can also infer the reason why Merica exiled Godfrey to begin with. Godwin's curse mark was to be safely kept at the round table hold inside the air tree in a place only the tarnish could reach, which can be inferred by the fact that that's where Dee finds Godwin's half-wheel curse mark. But that was a very precarious position she was about to put herself in, with the ring, herself, and her consort all shattered, locked up inside the tree. So after the events of the shattering had unfurled, should his aid become necessary, the returning first Elden Lord, ever loyal as he was, would be the one she could trust to mend the Elden Ring according to her plans, i.e. by using a full curse mark of death as if yet untempered by the likes of Fia and the ungodly nature of the Prince of Death. Grow strong in the face of death, she told them. Brandish the Elden Ring was her command. And now, with this purpose in mind, it becomes that much easier to understand why Merica shattered the Elden Ring. You can't mend something that isn't broken. The whole process is even hinted at by the fundamental principles of the Golden Order. First, in the land of reeds, the Golden Order is described with this kanji, which is a synonym to the Golden Rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This meaning is expanded upon by the concepts of causality and regression. The law of causality manifests a small ring that allows the caster to automatically retaliate upon receiving a certain number of blows. It is the pull between meanings, that which links all things in a chain of relation. Within the context of the shattering, causality is the means by which to attain regression through conflict, action, and reaction. The intended goal is to attain the power of destined death, but in lieu of this prize, mending the Elden Ring with any other rune still serves to expand the power pool of the greater will. And what better way to weed out the strongest among candidates than pitting us all against each other? This law is another hint regarding Godfrey's return as well, stating that, from the perspective of the Elden Ring, his forces would be automatically activated in case of an emergency. And regression, as it was hinted, is the goal towards which this system strives. Regression is the pull of meaning, that all things yearn eternally to converge. Overspecialization breeds weakness, therefore the goal is convergence of all powers unto the greater will via the Elden Ring. Evolution by intelligent design. In more practical terms, this is implied to increase survivability by the effects of the spell's law of regression, which heals the caster. An immutable shield, an incantation explicitly related to the law of regression that increases all defenses. Hmm. It occurs to me now that this entire concept is reminiscent of the philosophies associated with a pottery repair technique from the Land of Reeds which uses gold lacquer and understands that the repaired piece is more beautiful for having been broken. I've heard of it once from a scholar known as Christy Bartlett, who told me that not only is there no attempt to hide the damage, but the repair is literally illuminated, a kind of physical expression of the spirit of Mushin. Mushin is often translated as no mind, but carries connotations of fully existing within the moment, of non-attachment, of equanimity amid changing conditions the vicissitudes of existence over time, to which all humans are susceptible, could not be clearer than in the breaks, the knocks, and the shattering to which ceramic wear is too subject. This poignancy or aesthetic of existence has been known in the land of reeds as mono no aware, a compassionate sensitivity, or perhaps identification with things outside oneself. A quick side note here at the end that reads, a man called Patches told me of a land called Lordran, in which they too were familiar with the language of the Land of Reeds. Not entirely sure I can trust him, but he's been nothing but helpful thus far. In that land, he says, there is a practice commonly known as fire linking, which in the records from eastern lands is called fire repair or mending. 
Seems like this philosophy may not be exclusive to the lands between, after all. Wait a minute. Is this Patches person one of our agents? How come we have no previous records of this incident? What kind of heresy is this that they spout regarding the holiness of fire linking? Although now that they've mentioned it, are there any similarities between the two? No, of course not. There can't be. In the first flame we trust. Unforeseen Consequences Despite all their scheming, some things could not have been foreseen. The rise of the Lord of Chaos and Rani's Age of Stars both seek to undo the presence of the Greater Will in the Lands Between, and are therefore wholly incompatible with the Vision of Grace. From Rani's meddling, the birth of the Second Prince of Death is the first and most obvious unforeseen consequence. Besides the side effects of bringing back those who live in death, this also helps to explain most creatures' inability to simply stay dead. Commoners aren't gods, though arguably they should be. The citizens of the lands between were supposed to die and return to the Aird Tree. Instead, these undead wanderers became the pitiful product of unending life. Godwin's been grafted onto the Aird Tree's root system, throwing its resource extraction into disarray. Some of it gets siphoned to Godwin, some of it goes back to the source, and the Aird Tree is starved of its sustenance, which, along with the shattering of the Elden Ring, gives more context to the end of the Age of Plenty. This explains why the roots of the Great Tree are believed to no longer be connected to the Air Tree, a belief that is only technically true, which isn't always the best kind of true. They are still physically connected to each other, only the flow of resources, i.e. our life force, has been interrupted by the presence of the Prince of Death. And though I may be uncertain of this next conclusion, Godwin may also explain how the Tarnished are able to stave off the state of madness and undeath that besets most inhabitants of this post-shattering era of the lands between. The nomadic merchants touched by frenzy seem immune to these effects as well, and spurned by grace seems to be the common factor that unites us. Godfrey's people were devoid of benediction when Godwin was grafted to the Air Tree's root system meaning they had no grace to be caught up in the cycle of the Prince of Death. Whatever grace was restored to them came directly from the tree itself, and that could have been the excising factor that set them apart. Tarnished who now can be effectively killed might be related to most Tarnished having lost their ability to see the guidance of grace, which is equivalent to losing their unique connection to grace. In other words, losing its protection. And it seems reasonable to assume that instead of dying altogether, they simply join the ranks of mindless undead roaming the fields. And I must reiterate, my friend, that I am not certain of this particular conclusion. But if it does hold true, then we should take the time to properly place this instance within the context of America's prearranged plans. Considering all that we've discussed thus far, it could be said that having dealt with curse marks before America would have known of the dangers involved in their creation, which would make it tempting to attribute this turn of events to prescience. But it could just as easily be argued that America had no way of knowing Ronnie's Age of Stars would ever come to pass, meaning she would not have foreseen the need to protect the tarnished from this broken cycle of life and death. For once, happenstance seems as reasonable an assumption as any other to me and the truth of it is honestly yet to be ascertained. Let it not be said I am above accepting coincidence as a valid proposition, only that I require extensive evidence for it. Now let us move on, shall we, lest I give you the time to mock me so. Well, another unforeseen consequence comes rather in the form of something that definitely did not come to pass, as the members of the Sovereign Alliance were under the impression their fell brethren would return. There's a spirit in Castle Soul who says, Lord Mikola, forgive me. The sun has not been swallowed. Our prayers were lacking. Your comrade remains soulless. Being soulless implies this demigod to have died in the same manner as Godwin, clearly indicating America's sacrificed offspring were meant to come back to life after her plan had unfolded. This also helps to connect the soulless demigods to the Knight of the Black Knives via the Eclipse symbol prominently displayed by the Mausoleum Knights and the banners of Castle Soul to the Prince of Death. Since the Eclipse Shirtle's Death Flare has the power to set the lusterless sun ablaze with the Prince of Death's flames, this in turn provides new context to the symbol itself, since it is reminiscent of the curse mark of death and the mending rune of the Death Prince. 
And perhaps more importantly, here is also the case of Lutel, who serves to completely upend the interpretation most scholars I've heard of attributed to the Knight of the Black Knives. Lutel is specifically stated to have sacrificed her life so that in death she could continue to protect a soulless demigod until their revival, earning her the hero's honor of Aird Tree Burial. She not only compounds the previous argument, but the fact that Tell's sacrifice was seen as an honor befitting of a hero indicates the deaths carried out during the night of the plot were the byproduct of neither crude hatred nor simple greed. They were sacrificed, killed, perhaps even gruesomely so. But they had been forewarned, they were expected to return, and their deaths were honorable. Their sacrifice, righteous. Along this same line of thought, I have also inferred that Godwin was likely buried with honors in the Oriza hero's grave just outside Lindell. There we can find the Golden Epitaph, a sword made to commemorate the death of Godwin the Golden, first to the demigods to die. In its records, the kanji translated as commemorate means to mourn or to hold a funeral service. I should also point out that in the same hero's grave I encountered Ordovis, one of the two honored as foremost among the Crucible Knights who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. While Siluria, the other foremost Crucible Knight, stood guard in the nameless Eternal City, final resting place of Godwin the Golden. And lastly, a small detail that caught my attention nonetheless, is that the outer moat near Oriza has crabs bearing the face of the Prince of Death himself, despite the apparent lack of death root in that location. In the end, it sounds to me like the demigods were swindled along with the rest of us. But I tell you, Stray, that I hold no sympathy for their kind. They sell their souls for power while the rest of us fight for the right to keep our own, struggling to pick up the pieces of their decrepit legacy. Good riddance to you, O gods of old. May your headless bodies rot and your memories fade. By my own name, I swear the world shall endure your conceit no longer. Not if my kind has anything to say on the matter anyway. Bastard's Curse I heard it being said once, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they treat their offspring. I don't like being reductive, but this statement seems to hold some truth to me. After having spent all this time writing to you about Godwin the Golden, I feel it would be only right to present you a couple of lines regarding her less favored children as well. There's not much I can tell you about them, unfortunately, forgotten by the annals of history as they are. But acknowledging them should be a good enough first step, I think. For those of us who are mired in the quest for the Elden Ring, it is no secret that Morgoth, the Grace-given, and Moog, Lord of Blood, are children of America. Like all omens, Morgoth, the Veiled Monarch and Lord of Dell, was shunned from birth for his differences, for not fitting within the arbitrary standards against which he was measured. Perhaps simply for reminding those who see themselves as superior that they are not as pure, whatever that means, as they'd like to be. A blemish, best kept hidden, never to be spoken of. Something that caught me by surprise about him was that, unlike any other omen I've fought, his body transformed into a large yet very human-like figure after his defeat. After ruminating over the matter for some time, I've come to the conclusion that the fact he recanted his cursed blood, i.e. the essence of his being, seems to be the reason behind it. Given their association with the amalgamation process of the Crucible, which I've described in previous letters, means he'd have expunged that which is foreign to his progenitors, leading to the full anthropomorphization effect I witnessed. And though he was previously restrained through might and magic, I contend that the real shackles weren't placed upon his body, but imprinted in his soul. One can tear through stone walls with relative ease, but escaping a prison for the mind is another matter entirely. When you build the cell walls yourself, can you really tell the difference between passing loneliness and solitary confinement? His unflinching loyalty represents America's offspring spurning their perceived impurities in favor of grace. Though born one of the graceless omen, Morgoth took it upon himself to become the Erd Tree's protector. He loved not in return, for he was never loved, but nevertheless love it he did. Regarding his twin brother Moog, unfortunately the Lord of Blood is involved in much too deep a subject for this late hour in which I find myself writing to you. But I shall tell you about him in the next letter, old friend. I promise.
In the meantime, I'd like to shift the topic at hand for a moment and talk about the misbegotten who share roots with the omen, tracing back to the crucible that blended all life together. As you may have guessed, I believe America to have birthed the misbegotten as well. And you may also have predicted that there are no records of it, should it prove to be true. They are held to be a punishment for making contact with the crucible, and just as the omen are maimed and shunned, the misbegotten are enslaved and tortured. So much for the so-called golden age these hypocrite blue bloods claim to uphold, huh? Among these beings of peculiar veneer, the Leonine Misbegotten are particularly powerful creatures whose red manes can be traced back to America, as seen in her depiction found inside the Round Table Hold. One such creature can be seen alongside one of Godfrey's Crucible Knights after Rodan has been defeated. And another one, more noteworthy than the rest despite its unassuming circumstances, is found in the Cave of the Forlorn wielding the Golden Order Greatsword, forged by King Consort Radigan to proudly symbolize the tenets of the Golden Order. Many a Leonine misbegotten carry legendary armaments such as this, but given its origins, I must say this one in particular is unlikely to have found its way into the hands of anyone not directly connected to America herself. And I reckon his title of Crusader or Holy Knight supports that conclusion too, since it implies an official charge of some sort. Landell's royalty wasn't above using the omen as cannon fodder. Seems reasonable they'd be willing to do the same with their brethren misbegotten. And should one of them be descended of pure royal blood, it seems reasonable they'd be granted an honorific token like this sword. Especially considering Radigan is Merica, meaning Rinala's wedding gift would be spurned rather than honored in her eyes. An expression of sorcery purified by grace, to remind her desecrated offspring of the purity they never have. With all that in mind, it's possible the loathsome Dung Eater, another tarnished I met in my journeys, though calling him fellow would be a step too far, is either an offspring or a descendant of Merica, a more dilute breed of Leonine Misbegotten. He boasts a head of red hair and clearly associates himself with the Omen. Within this context, his words, the rotten fools, my fate was the grandest, most brilliant of them all, it could be interpreted as a relationship built on jealousy and spite between the Dung Eater and his omen kin, Morgoth and Moog. If the Dung Eater was in fact born from Merica, or at least descended from her, then along with Moog he'd represent the antithesis of Morgoth, Merica's offspring spurning grace in favor of that which others would call impurities. There's a single side note here saying, In the land of reeds, the omen are called by a word that means shunned or abhorrent child. Nowadays, it seems most commonly but not exclusively used in modern media and the literature. There was a time when twins were considered abhorrent. Yamato Takeru, a prince who slew his older brother, being one possible example of note. The All-Knowing and the Blind After having written for so long about gods and monsters, at the end of this missive I find myself reminiscing on Gideon, another lowly tarnished such as me. Despite his pompous self-appointed title of all-knowing, and despite his honestly aggravating manners, I admit he's grown on me to some extent. For one thing, he once confessed his title isn't meant to reflect any perceived status, but merely to serve as a guiding light to remind him of his own quest, which he continues to grasp for, even though he knows it to be unattainable. And truly, the search for absolute knowledge is something I can personally sympathize with. And he was misguided like most of us are, sure, hell-bent on fulfilling Merica's designs at any cost. But to my surprise, he was among the rare sort to negate her wishes, neither for profit nor power nor out of vanity or hatred. And that alone may be enough for me to overlook his less than charming demeanor. Even if it isn't enough for me to overlook his unleashing of a vengeful blade upon the meek of that secluded village. But you, old friend, you, I'm afraid, wouldn't have any patience for the likes of him from the very start. Perhaps silent lakeside lessons are more to your liking, and I can hardly blame you for that. Back to Gideon, though. He's always by the sidelines, but always involved. He's the guardian of Horalu's last descendant. He had envoys in Mount Gelmir, omen killers under his service, knowledge of the relationship between the Albanorix and the Halic Tree, and he even acted as confidant for the two fingers in their moment of uncertainty. But all that begs the questions of how and why. Well, the most likely explanation I was able to find is that he may have been among the tarnished in the one ship Godfrey left behind, meaning he served Merica in the original round table hold and 
presumably later continued to do so. During our first grace-given vision, there is a statue reminiscent of imps shown next to his resting place. If imps are a cultural artifact exclusive to the lands between, that should serve as an argument to support that idea. And if Gideon worked for America, that'd also have given him the means to glimpse into her designs, leading to his ultimate disillusionment. Queen America has high hopes for us, that we continue to struggle unto eternity. But alas, a man cannot kill a god. Mending the Elden Ring always perpetuates the greater will in one form or another. We may kill its vassal, but the force behind it and its system of control will endure. The cycles will continue unto eternity. A god isn't something you can put the sword to. Therefore, a man simply cannot kill a god. But Gideon, you old fool, it didn't have to be this way. We can still extricate them from ourselves, from the world around us. Or at least we can try. Together. You and I, for the rest of us, we can try. And once again, there is a postscript in another hand. This one's brief. It just says, we can try. Your narrator has been a lie, remains a lie, or stray as he is sometimes known. That's done with. Took long enough, sorry about that. Even though this video was about America, half of her lore had already been discussed in the previous video about Destiny Death, but there were two things that needed to be explored, right? And hopefully, this can help give you a more complete picture. Regarding the previous video, I'd like to say a few words on the topic of Malikath and Gurank, since one of the viewers, Darren Galloway, presented me with some counter-arguments, the answers to which I think are worth committing to video. It seems to be a common belief that Malikath and Gurank are the same, and he argued from that point of view. Well, the points he brought up were that they have the same model and voice, that Blythe doesn't die until we've killed its two fingers, and that Grunk has the seal containing the Rune of Death. And I'll just um, kind of read my reply here. Uh, so, first, let's address the points I think make that position an impossibility. They are in two different places at the same time which is usually explained by saying Farun Azula is outside slash in another time, but as I've stated in the video, that's not true. We can see the burning earth tree from Farun, clearly indicating the city exists at the same time as everything else, and without this explanation, the fact they are in two different places at the same time makes the assumption they are the same an impossibility. And there's also the fact that after we kill Malikev, we can still interact with Gurank as nothing's happened. Completing Gurank's questline gives Malikev new dialogue, implying there was some communication between them. But killing Malikev doesn't make Gurank hostile which indicates both that said communication flowed exclusively from the Sanctum to Farun, and also that they are not the same individual, since having killed him once and, more importantly, having stolen the Rune of Death, that would most certainly make Rank hostile towards us, if they were the same, of course. Uh, second, regarding the arguments that were presented, they look the same, but A. Godric and Godefroy also look the same, but are distinct individuals. Just to set a precedent there. B. They aren't human, they are beastmen, and all beastmen look the same to us. And C. There are the beast clergyman statues in Farum Mazula that imply not only a whole caste of clerics, but also that they looked quote-unquote the same. Um, 
they both have personal ties to Erika, which is another point he had brought up, but all Shadowbound beasts have ties to the same family through their respective Empyreans. They just have different ties to the same person. Um, Blythe comes back over and over, but I think that's actually an argument against the idea Gurank and Malikav are the same, since not only doesn't Malikav come back over and over to fight us like Blythe does, even though he'd have more than enough reasons to do so. Um, but as I said before, even if we go to Gurank ourselves, he's still not hostile, despite us having stolen the Rune of Death. And I've heard people mention the seal they both have before, and I must say that ornament does not hold the Rune of Death. Malikav's Black Blade explicitly says blade which once harbored the power of the Rune of Death. Malikav bound the blade within his own flesh, such that no one might ever rob death again. The rune was inside his body, and he retrieved it by stabbing his hand. The ornament, or supposed seal, was just in the way. And lastly, after all that, the question would remain of who Grunk is then, if not Malikav, to which I have answered the Glomite Queen's Shadowbound Beast, considering she was also an Empyrean and would have one such beast of her own. Hopefully that helps to clarify my position to anyone else who might also have had doubts after watching the video. And thanks, Darren, for reaching out. Engaging with counter-arguments is the best way to either make my theories stronger or making me change my mind about them, if I'm proven wrong. Which I've done before. I really appreciate that. Thanks as well to everyone else for watching this video. And a special thanks to the fine people helping support this channel at Patreon. John, Ethan Finlay, Sinclair Lore, Balan, Several Bats, Steel Vampire, Sunbee, Hubal, Taylor Reed, Uber Einzinga, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Medium Hat Logan, also name, Simon Ward, George Island, Derp, and a special mention to Isolith One, who was a patron when I started making the video but couldn't be around for when the video was finished. You just take care of yourself, and I really hope things turn up well for you, man. And uh, since we're making special mentions, then, well, welcome to all of the new faces. Um, also, John is my best friend. I love you, buddy. Sinclair and Sophie represent the best the Soulsborn community has to offer. Ethan, we haven't spoken in some time, but I truly hope you're doing well over there. Several Bats is the one also known as Stray, also known as a lie remains a lie, and we all owe him some thanks, I think. And uh, Taylor. Taylor is the flower-based Jish slamming scholar I mentioned in a previous video side note. Just an all-around smart guy with interesting questions and ideas. Uh, okay, I think this outro has run its course, it's kinda long enough already, so... Until next time, stay safe and uh, see you around.